guess we'll, whenever Don's ready, he'll turn on the on air. There we go. Okay, hi everybody. Welcome to our How to Open a Business in Lincoln Park Open Forum. Um, I'm James Grazan, the city manager. Um, quick introductions. I'm going to go off of our slide there so it's in order. So we've got John Myers, our building official, Liz Gundin, our planner, uh, Bob Rizzo, our assessor, Katie Pope, our appraiser, Carl Malish, who is our director of the EDC and DDA, um, and then Sharon King with the Chamber of Commerce, and then Jose Lemus, our intern who's been helping us out for the last couple of months here. Um, so I think really that's, that's much of it for the introductions. Just quick, we've got uh, some of our council members in attendance here. Councilwoman Tracy Dupre, Councilwoman Maureen Tobin, Councilman uh, Mike Higgins, Councilman Larry K Kelsey, and Councilwoman Lillian Ross in the back there. So with that, we can uh, get rolling into this, our quick overview. We're going to go through uh, the summary of existing conditions here in Lincoln Park the buildings, the age of them, um, and why sometimes some of the things we do might seem odd to other people, but there's a reason for it. Um, we're going to go through went quick. Uh, going to go through an overview of the development review process. So how does this work? How does this whole thing work? You hear about regulations. What do they mean? What are they? This is what we're talking about. Uh, Carl's going to give us a little bit of information on how the city can help assist with uh, development, and then a good chance for all of you to ask questions at the end there. So we'll move on now. Whoever's clicking on, it's John. All right, to the department overviews. And with that, give that to uh, Mr. Myers. Oh, older buildings. Um, if you, most of you are more familiar with the city than I am, but my name is John Myers. I'm the building official for the city of Lincoln Park for about the last five years. And um, we have, uh, the assessors can give you more real numbers, about 17,000 parcels. We have about maybe 4,000 in businesses. And the buildings that we have in existence for the most part are anywhere between uh, 68 and 95 years old in that range of time. So a lot of our existing buildings, so obviously we have some new some miniature strip malls along uh, the three corridors. But other than that, that's really where we are. Public safety is not really my area, but I just want to introduce you. Our, old, our buildings are old. Uh, we have on Fort Street a lot more than anywhere else. We have some mixed use buildings, meaning they are both uh, residential and business. Uh, some of them, or a number of them, haven't been in business and operating on both issues for quite some time. But as we review them, our job is to make sure that both the resident and the business are brought to safety and code as in a pre-existing building and l letting that operate. All right? Who's next after me? <laughs> Maybe I'm just going to run right through this, this PowerPoint, I guess. What happens when we don't uh, enforce a code is pretty simple. Uh, fires occur, damages occur, people uh, get sick, get injured, and people then die. And, and if, whether it's in a house or it's in a business, injuries affect people's lives, and then it oftentimes shuts down the neighboring business beside it. So our job is to watch the condition of businesses building safety for the benefit of the occupant of that building. So if we don't keep it regulated using the fire department and the building department as the legal guardians in governing uh, enforcement regulators, then these buildings stay old-fashioned, out of date, unwired, unplumbed correctly, and new, new generations come, and then we have long-term problems. It number then three has a tendency to cause property value to decline because it hasn't been upgraded along the way over the last 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Um, we are legally responsible to implement the law. My job as, as the building official is a really, uh, let me put it in a very plain words, there are policemen or former policemen in the, in the office, audience. Their job is to enforce law on behalf of people. My job is to be the regulator of building safeties. So on our responsibility is for every parcel in the city and how it is manage, managed, maintained, and developed into its future use. So our legally responsible, so when I got the opportunity, first I 
was required to become a licensed building contractor. And then I was sworn in as a building inspector uh, and swore to hold the law of the codes. And then to be a plan reviewer, again, you have to swear in with the state to uphold the laws. And then when I was registered a number of years ago now to be a building official, my responsibility was to uphold all state and federal laws as well as local ordinances as they are presently existing in that municipality. And so. I kind of take that serious at my age. My grandchildren do not have any ambition to see me in jail because I decided to turn my cheek and let someone do whatever they want. So when you look at what we're trying to do in the business is we're just trying to regulate what state has and, and what the um, city ordinance have until one or both make changes in the rules and regulations. All right? Hi, I'm Liz, the, bill, or the um, planner for the city. Um, I'm going to talk very briefly about um, planning and zoning, and then John will, will add some comments about building again. But um, just generally speaking, I implement the zoning ordinance. John implements the building code. Um, planning is everything from the outside of the building to the property lines. Building cares about what's inside the building. It's a very simplified version of what we do. You could go to the next slide, unless you have something to add. No. Okay. So when we're talking about planning, um, this is just a very <coughs> simplified version or flow chart of sort of what go what we go through. So if somebody is coming in and they have a they have a, a property that they're interested in and a specific use that they want to do, the first thing that we do is does the zoning allow for it? So um, if it does, then the next, so let's say you want to put in a restaurant in a commercial area that is a permitted use. Then the next question is, is this a change of use from what it was previously? Um, if it is, then um, you would go through the planning process, which involves a site plan. The different departments review it. It goes to the planning commission, then it gets planning approval, and then it gets to the building department. If your rest, if the your restaurant in that building, if it was previously a restaurant, it does not need to go through that planning part. It goes straight to the building department. Yay. <laughs> the building department system is pretty simple. Again, if you are a commercial building, you're not regulated by a contractor. You're rated, rated by, you're regulated by the drawings on that building. And so if for some reason you decided in getting ready for your certificate of occupancy, <coughs> you were going to do some modifications on your building. You already went through planning review and you think you're going to get pretty much. So you started doing some planning and rearranging the walls, the destruction, I mean the, the design of your building and your office spaces. And, and to do that, you need a permit and you need a building permit that is qualified by a set of sealed drawings. An architect has to draw them. When that happens, then you have to take on all the other trades behind it. So if you need electric, plant, mechanical, or plumbing, they have to come also by a licensed contractor to do so. Where the city sometimes gets confused is getting through the drawings and the modification of your building isn't your certificate of occupancy inspection. It is just separated. You get a certificate of, of, of approval when all of them are done. But then you have to apply for a certificate of occupancy because we add one more party to that. Example, if you didn't need any plumbing in your, in your design, we add four people. We have the building, we have electrical, mechanical, plumbing, and then we have the fire department. When all five of those depart departments sign off, then your certificate of occupancy. A lot of people think, well, I've already modified it. Why wouldn't I just get my CFO? because we add the fire department inside it oftentimes, where maybe your modifications had nothing to do with the fire department. So therefore you have the CFO, and then from there your inspections, you get your CFO. Only after you get your CFO can you get to the city clerk for your license for registration of a business. Oh, the clerk is not here, but the registration for the business is simply only given, and, and if you don't know our clerk, wonderful historian of the city, and, and 
she has a very strong personality that says, I don't see your certificate of occupancy, whether temporary or complete. Go back to John Myers and yell at him some more before you come back to my office because I'm not giving you your registration until he has it. And that's a working relationship between departments. All right? Hi, my name is Kathleen and I'm the appraiser for this city and I have the pleasure of working with Bob who is our assessor and uh, you may not think about assessing when starting a business um, it's not usually the first place that people run um, however you may want to especially if you did purchase the property so anytime that you sign a deed or a land contract in the state of Michigan you want to come see us uh, within 45 days of putting that ink on that paper um, you would file a property transfer affidavit in that situation and when that doesn't happen within the 45 days days um, of course there's penalties um, the state allows uh, for a penalty for a commercial property of $20 a day to a maximum of $1,000 um, some commercial properties have more than one parcel so that can be especially unfortunate for somebody who has the excitement of just purchasing the property and now we have sent them a bill for $3,000 because they have three parcels and they didn't file anything with us we don't want to do that so come see us in that situation if you're unsure come ask the questions um, one time that irregardless whether you are renting or purchasing the business um, you will come see us uh, to file a personal property statement um, in February it's typically the 20th of the year uh, of the 20th of the month rather um, that that personal property statement needs to be filed that's for the contents of the building and that's assessed based on situs so where the property is as of the last day of the previous tax year so for 2022 whatever contents you had in the building as of December 31st of 2021 is what you'll claim um, the good news is is for a small business there is a small business taxpayer exemption and um, starting for the 2023 tax year that limit is going to be raised from 80,000 in personal property to 180,000 in personal property so that means as long as you file that statement with us um, evil assessor Bob does not have to by state law have to put a valuation on that if you don't file anything with us he's forced to do that and um, there's really no remedy for us to correct that so sometimes people end up with tax bills and they come in we know that they're telling us the truth they have four desks and a computer and they're still paying something on that personal property so um, that's definitely important um, we really strive in our department to help people so forms can be um, confusing we don't want anybody to miss those deadlines we like to demystify those processes um, so that you can focus on what's important which is your new business and making that profitable and an asset um, to yourself and to the community as well so other documents that you may come to uh, find that we can offer you record cards field sheets which have a historical sketch of the building um, we also can offer you um, an application if you want to do a lot split or combination um, we do have uh, the plat maps which you can certainly review we're happy to show you what that legal description of your property actually means and every year you do get to receive uh, one of those confusing uh, change assessment notices that say this is not a tax bill at the top um, that just lets you know what those taxes are going to be for the upcoming year so you can come and yell at evil Bob too so um, and really like I said the most important thing if you have a question come ask um, because if it's not our department we certainly will um, point you in the right direction so thank you can everybody hear me this is it now okay 
My name is Carl Malish, as uh, the introduction uh, indicated earlier. Um, I'm the director of the Downtown Development Authority and the Economic Development Corporation. Um, I'm, uh, we have a small staff that serves both of those entities. Uh, at this point in time, uh, I'm the full-time person, and we do have uh, an intern, Jose Limas, and he was introduced as well. So um, I want to explain what the DDA and the EDC uh, can do in assisting people to establish businesses in uh, the city of Lincoln Park. Um, I'm going to answer a few questions. For instance, why would you come to the DDA EDC staff to begin with? Uh, what's the function of both of those organizations? What current projects are the DDA and the EDC working on? And what economic development tools or assistance could be made available to you as you venture to establish a business in Lincoln Park? Next slide, please. So why would you come in to talk with the DDA staff, uh, either at this point in time myself or Jose? Well, uh, you might want to come in as a first point of contact with the city to get some general information on economic development opportunities in the city of Lincoln Park. Um, it, not only in Lincoln Park, but more specifically in the downtown. <laughs> Um, we do have information that might be useful. We have access to traffic counts, uh, population numbers, uh, socioeconomic data, and the like. You know, those might be important uh, bits of information that you might want to consider as you're uh, working through uh, your business plan or uh, thinking about how you approach the business in Lincoln Park. Um, you might want to discuss your business with us. Uh, tell us a little bit about what you're planning to do. Uh, we uh, would like to know uh, some uh, information. Do you have a business plan, for instance? Uh, towards the end of this uh, presentation, we're going to identify some pitfalls that you might run into. And uh, having a business plan is rather important. And uh, we might be able to help you in that venture. Uh, you may only have an idea. You may be, uh, have an excellent idea for something that you think could be uh, an, a useful product uh, developed and put in the marketplace. Uh, you know, you can think about that on your own. We also have contacts with some people in Flint uh, at the Ferris Wheel Development, and they have sort of a think tank to evaluate uh, ideas, uh, do some market research to see if they have a chance of success in the marketplace, and to make recommendations how, on how you would proceed uh, to accomplish that outcome. Um, as I said, you may need help to put together a business plan. We have uh, access, uh, contacts with nonprofit organizations that can assist in that. Uh, we also have a relationship with the Small Business Administration, both in Lansing and uh, the local uh, districts uh, that include the Detroit metro area. Um, you may need some referrals to some other city departments. Um, you know, you may be at a point where you do need to check out the zoning uh, to see if the, if the site that you're anticipating is properly zoned. Uh, you know, we could put you in contact with the likes of Elizabeth and uh, she would be able to answer those questions. You may have uh, some immediate questions with the building department. We could make referrals there. Um, you know, there, uh, those would be internal referrals that would be very easy to accomplish. We're all in the same building here, so, you know, it's not that big a deal. Um, we may also give you outside referrals. I mentioned SBA, uh, the Ferris Wheel in Flint. Uh, we have relationships so that you don't have to necessarily drive to Flint to see the people at the Ferris Wheel. They do have websites, and we can arrange to have that conversation that you need to have uh, via the Internet. Um, 
we you might also be at a point in time where you're ready to go with the property and you might be struggling to uh, put together your entire financial package uh, for improvements to the property well we have some financial assistance tools that would be of use to you and I'm going to talk about those a little bit later could I have the next slide please so uh, just as a couple of points of reference um, the uh, downtown development authority was created uh, back in the mid 90s 1995 to be exact it was at that point in time when communities throughout uh, the state of Michigan really throughout the, the country were hopping on board uh, with the, with the prospect of helping to renovate downtowns uh, people recognized that the downtown was essentially the heart of the community and it was a very important uh, space in the city and uh, much to its credit it. back at that point in time Lincoln Park set up a downtown development authority and it uh, espoused the Main Street approach uh, to uh, work on the downtown I'll mention that again in a minute um, the Economic Development Corporation was created even earlier than the DDA uh, back in 1976 and I kind of remember this because I was around then so many of you probably were not you know you're all much younger than I am uh, the country had a difficulty uh, we were in a recession period uh, we were in the in the the the, uh, uh, the air of stagnation uh, stagflation stagnant economy rising inflation so the federal government uh, created and ramped up the Economic Development Administration and one of the things that they did was help cities create economic development corporations and gave them funding so that they could develop the so-called industrial park we have a small industrial park uh, that was uh, initiated in in the 70s and that's along that uh, John Pavlis Drive um, today the EDC uh, uses some of the resources that it recaptured from some projects back in that era and uh, it provides uh, some degrees of incentives for uh, businesses uh, that exist in the city next slide please Okay, um, what current projects are the DDA and the EDC involved in right now? Let's talk a minute about the DDA. Um, as I said, the DDA espouses to the National Main Street approach. And basically that's an approach where uh, you focus on organization, membership, uh, uh, promotion, economic restructuring, and uh, uh, physical improvements okay you, you focus on all those uh, type those categories of activities in the downtown in a very specific geography uh, the DDA has a very specific geography for the downtown uh, there's a larger area and then there's a core area that it focuses on um, right now we are um, we've assessed what's going on in the downtown uh, since I've come in to town I've been here about a year and a half now and we are making strides and planning to uh, ignite some spaces in the downtown as an example we have a relationship with a national fitness campaign uh, we received uh, some money from them and we're receiving money from others to develop at the corner of Euclid and Fort Street an outdoor fitness court that if you recall is vacant property there's a few uh, plants and uh, some people kind of keep it up and clean uh, but uh, we talked with the national fitness campaign and they like the idea of the uh, outdoor fitness court at that location so we're moving forward at that point at that site um, why, why are we igniting some of these sites in the downtown well quite frankly we have uh, downtown right now that has lots of empty buildings and we have a lot of vacant spaces and we see very little pedestrian traffic on that corridor the Fort Street corridor in particular so we want to uh, make some investments uh, that are not huge investments but ones that will ignite spaces in the downtown and possibly draw uh, people 
back downtown so they can look at these things, use the outdoor fitness court, so on and so forth. Our intent is that those uh, sites that we ignite will give uh, uh, support and strength to people that would choose to open businesses in the downtown. Some of this is already happening organically. If you uh, happen to be on Fort Street recently, you probably noticed that there's several businesses uh, that have started anew on Fort Street, and they're brought to you by the uh, Hispanics that have moved into the community. We have a growing Hispanic population, and we intend to uh, work closely with that group uh, so that they will see fit to make investments in our downtown and our community. Um, okay. Oops. Why did? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay. So, um, a couple other things we got going on. We we are going to relocate the farmers market uh, from a very dangerous corner at Fort and Southfield, and we're going to move it at least temporarily to the Mellis Park site. Uh, everybody know where that P Mellis Park site is? It's on the east side of Fort Street. Um, uh, just uh, between Park Restaurant and uh, the uh, Mexican Treat Store. I uh, can't remember the name of it. Pardon me. Thank you. Jose? Good. Um, so uh, anyway, we're going to do that. Uh, we're also, uh, we also will have a display of uh, indoor out uh, art exhibits uh, from the Detroit Institute of Arts. We've got several locations, again, primarily on Fort Street, uh, where we're going to uh, place those outdoor exhibits. We'll have some, uh, some uh, narrative tours to explain the art and uh, some other things that we're thinking about doing, again, to draw people downtown, uh, to excite the downtown, and show people that think about investing that there is a future for our downtown. Um, we are also doing the Fort Street Transportation Equity Study uh, and plan, and basically what that is, is we're reassessing um, the, uh, the whole of uh, Fort Street from Outer Drive um, through the downtown. We are going to uh, evaluate whether we can reduce some travel lanes uh, right now we have a six-lane six divided highway. It's very difficult in particular for pedestrians. Uh, if we're going to get new businesses locating in our downtown buildings, uh, we have to make it appealing for foot traffic. And uh, so we're doing the study, we're going to develop a plan, and we're going to access uh, some of this uh, American Recovery Act money uh, from the state and elsewhere to make these improvements. Um, we also do landscape maintenance and uh, keep the uh, uh, trash and other in the sidewalks clean in the downtown. We also are entering a second year of a downtown banner program. Uh, we encourage people that have businesses anywhere in Lincoln Park to purchase ads that are placed on these banners. Uh, the banners that we're developing for the second year, uh, and they've been up one year already, they were celebrating our 100th anniversary of the founding as a village. The second year, we are uh, expressing welcome to the multicultural population that we have in Lincoln Park, again, who we expect to become entrepreneurs and fill spaces in the downtown. Um, last but not least, we have seasonal events that we do. Chocolate Walk is uh, in, in the late winter. Cinco de Mayo is coming up uh, at the uh, <coughs> beginning of May. There's a downriver cruise. We used to have a, a site for a band on that weekend event. We're going to reinstitute that. Uh, we are planning some sort of a fall event. Um, that we'll get into at a later point in time. And then we also have the holiday seasonal light up in the downtown. Okay, let's have the next slide, please. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, Economic Development Corporation. Uh, we're focusing on these projects. The redevelopment of former Sears site. Uh, there have been fits and starts with that property. Uh, we're dealing with some more or different owners now. 
um, and the jury's out on how that's going to redevelop, but we're <coughs> working with those companies. Uh, we're also working with the current ownership of the Lincoln Park Plaza. We put together uh, a site plan that uh, expressed uh, that we could support some housing back on that vast parking lot that nobody uses anymore. Uh, and we also calculated that we could reduce the size of that parking lot to get some housing because the uh, retail outlets don't require that much parking. When that parking lot was developed, it was uh, set up at the standard of uh, one space per, um, wait a minute, what was it? Uh, one space per thousand square feet, uh, or what is it, 5.5, somebody help me out. We're, we're the zoning pros here. <laughs> it, it was essentially, yeah, it was five per thousand square feet, or one per 200 square feet. That is an excessive standard. Uh, as you can see, nobody parks there. Uh, so we came up with a plan uh, to show the property owners that we could convert some of that uh, with the right developer to housing. Uh, so those are you know, some of the planning activities that the EDC gets involved in. Another one that's uh, very important, uh, and I'm skipping down the list here, is the Southfield Road Corridor Study and Plan, uh, particularly between Fort Street through Lincoln Park Eastward and through Ecourse, this is a bi-city study. We are evaluating that corridor uh, from soup to nuts. Uh, we're looking at land use, we're looking at traffic, we're looking at uh, the infrastructure, and we're going to come up with a plan, uh, a viable plan that we can actually implement so that we can see that corridor redevelop in an appropriate manner. Um, we should be finished with that about mid-year. Um, we're also involved with the Redevelopment Ready Communities Program. Uh, one of the best practices for Redevelopment Ready Communities is to have open forums like this to explain what it is we're doing uh, as a city to inspire economic development. So this helps us check a box with that state program. Last couple of things, uh, the EDC was quite involved at the staff level with the food truck ordinance that's been adopted, and we're also working with the development team, many of the people you see up here today, uh, to come up with an, uh, an approach, a contract, and a, and a professional to do our zoning <coughs> code rewrite. Could I have the next slide, please? Okay, so uh, what tools are available? Uh, the ED, or excuse me, the DDA has about four things that I'm going to mention here. Number one, we have a facade grant program. If you are a property owner in the downtown and you're willing to invest money to improve either your facade and or your site uh, that's visible from the public uh, thoroughfare, we would be willing to match dollar for dollar up to $10,000 uh, of, of city funds, DDA funds, to help you fund making facade improvements to your building, okay? You know, we've got uh, documents on our website that explain the program. Um, I'm very willing to meet with people face-to-face -to, -face to go through the application forms and things of that nature. Uh, if you're willing to put some money in, so is the city through the DDA. We also have uh, a downtown banner program. Um, that is uh, entering its second year. I mentioned it a minute ago. This is an opportunity for businesses, not only in the downtown, but also throughout the community to purchase space for their uh, ad on a banner. The banners are placed on the decorative uh, light poles in the downtown. And that would be up and down Fort Street and uh, along the Southfield Road corridor. We also have um, opportunities uh, for uh, business. Now, this isn't us giving you money or a resource, but we have opportunities for local businesses to be sponsors of our seasonal events. Uh, we are in a drive right now to get sponsors for Cinco de Mayo. Um, that festival, which is held, uh, you know, close to May 5th this year, it's going to be on April 30th, uh, is on a Saturday. It runs uh, all day, and it's a costly festival. It costs us about $10,000, uh, give or take, 
and uh, we uh, are soliciting businesses to make contributions. And uh, Maureen Tobin, one of our council people, is uh, in the audience this evening, and she'd be glad to speak with you about that. Absolutely, and I probably will leave it if you don't. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And then um, one other thing that we got going, and this is in the pending column, but uh, some of the ARPA money that uh, the city received, we're going to use a small pool of it, about $125,000. We're going to use that to help businesses activate outdoor spaces in front of their buildings in the downtown. You know, restaurants like to have an outdoor seating area. It's not as simple as you think, though. Fort Street is uh, regulated by MDOT, so we also have to get through the MDOT hurdle for permits. Right now, it's every man or woman for himself to deal with MDOT. What we're going to do is create a relationship with MDOT and streamline the process. I think we, we can explain to them that you know we know right of way. Um, we've got a lot of experts in that. Uh, we also can understand what their policies are and we can, in advance, work with the property owners, get the plans, fast track them to MDOT. Then we'll be able to come up with cost sharing uh, to pay for the improvements that would go out in the right of way. The seating, the fencing, or the whatever it is. Um, okay, a couple more things and then I'll be quiet. Uh, EDC Small Business Loan Program. Yes, we have a small business loan program. Uh, this is a loan program wherein a property owner, if he chooses uh, to make improvements to his property, he may apply to the EDC for a loan of up to $25,000. We have very flexible <coughs> terms on repayment, uh, typically 10 years, and the interest rate is uh, relatively low. Right now it's set at 5%. Um, we also have uh, brownfield assessment programs uh, that we can access. If you happen to be in a building or on a property that was vacant and had some uh, strange use in the past, uh, an old gas station or something of that nature, say, uh, we could access funds to do environmental assessments to determine whether those properties needed remediation. If they do need remediation, we can get money to develop a plan, and then we can figure out a strategy on how we can fund uh, one way or another the cleanup, and then the eventual redevelopment of the property. Last but not least, uh, we do have access and we keep up with uh, <coughs> programs of the Michigan Economic Development Corporation. Um, and uh, we put information on the city website when there's a flash uh, that something is available. And we also can discuss with you what it is you're trying to accomplish. And we can get into our Rolodex and figure out what programs, if any, might help uh, through the MEDC. So that's it for me. Thank you. Do I have these? Yeah, for the, it's for the cameras. I'm just loud, so I know that I don't need it. Yeah, it's not for the room, it's for the Okay. Recording. I'm Sharon King. I'm from the Lincoln Park Chamber of Commerce. And um, we're, based, we're a nonprofit organization that helps businesses, creates relationships between the business and the city. And we have businesses inside Lincoln Park as well as outside of Lincoln Park that is a part of the chamber. And a few things that we do is um, we do advertising for our customers on our website, on our Facebook page, things like that. We do business referrals. People, the majority of the phone calls that come to our office are business inquiries wondering, you know, do you have this, do you have that? So we're always referring our customers as well as I still do refer other Lincoln Park businesses. <laughs> Um, we do the free promotions, kind of like the advertising um, on our website and on our Facebook page. We try to find out what the businesses are doing, and then I'll post their specials or if they have something going on. Um, we do ribbon cuttings and grand openings, so if they, the business contacts us, then we will, I will then go from making sure everything's good with the departments in the city, and then 
inviting the mayor, city council, other business owners to join us at your business for your grand opening and your ribbon cutting. So that's always fun. Um, we do have on our website, we have all the listings of our, our members and their contact information. Um, we have different ways and things that we can help you get in touch with city officials, meet meet your elected city council and things like that. So we to have different ways and we can get you in touch with people that you would like to meet and talk to. And as far as that, um, just networking with different business owners. One of the biggest things the Lincoln Park Chamber does as far as our outreach is our fantasy land, which is our Christmas program. And we do get to meet a lot of people through there. We get to meet as far as customers, but as business owners and things like that that come through. So if you have any questions, I do have information on the chamber and I'd be happy to talk to you. I should read this before I let you answer. Uh, um, before we have a tendency in the city, people get pretty angry at my office, and typically me, is because they have a tendency to have a landlord who would like to lease them a piece of property, and they talk them into how wonderful it would be to have that piece of property, and, and it's a great place for it, but they forget to decide to call the building department and ask for one question. They only have to do is ask one question. Can you verify if this is zoned for the kind of business I want? And we're going to give you a piece of paper. You're going to fill it out. You're going to describe that. I'm going to look at it, and then I'm going to send it over to her in the plan and she's going to document my agreement or disagreement. She's going to send it back. If we agree that it is or it isn't, then we'll send it to you and say, well done. Then, so the, the biggest problem we have in our city right now is when people decide they're going to make plans without checking with the city's official standards and positions. They assume everything, if it has an open building and it's big enough for their business, it must be okay. And then you know what the next sentence is. Any business is better than having an empty building so it should be allowed anyhow. Well, I remember I told you at the beginning, by the state and by the city when I came here, I'm one of the few staff that have to hold the right hand up and swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, and fulfill all the laws. Uh, well, that's one of the laws we have to fulfill. You have to make sure that you're in the right place for the right business. So the number one mistake is people buy and, and they go, I've already got five months in and I can't even get to the, you can't even go in at all because uh, you can't put that business in that building. That's the number one mistake. If we could convince people to pay attention to that one rule, we would clear the board on a lot of disappointing people that make plans. Uh, not leaving enough time for review. They're assuming that if they handed me a piece of paper today, I am primary. There's nobody else on the list, and we have nobody, hell, no other clients, no other person that has a job on the table. They're assuming that Liz and myself have nobody else but the person that walks in and puts a piece of paper on the paper. And so what we do want to do is have uh, performance standards that's correct or accurate. Well, we want to, you understand that standards would be 14 days if I'm looking at plan reviews. Or, or if it's a local small business, it might be seven days. And if it's in-house, it might be 24 hours. But the problem is we don't leave enough time for the review of what has to go on. The next piece that happens is we don't understand the building conditions. So they assume it looks nice to them. They have a couple ideas. But then they forget that when the building department comes in for your CFO, they go, we have to do what? And then they go back and, you know, they go to the council and they go to the mayor and they go to the city manager and they go, these guys are harassing me. It's an old existing building. Leave it alone. I'll put some paint on it and call it a day. Well, I don't have that. There's a book that's designed by the state that's called Remo Renovation or Reusing of Existing Pre-Developed Buildings. And that standard is what I have to follow. And so when I look at your building, I don't want you to rebuild it. I just need, if what you need to do in it has to be brought all the way up to code, or you're just going to modify it and we can bring it up to an existing use of the code. But you have to 
as the tenant or the owner who may not know that law. They need to depend on the experts or the city's hired hands, Liz and myself, to define what the condition of those buildings are. And then working without a permit, a building permit, or working without a C of O, um, <laughs> If there's anything that gets under my skin worse than anything else, is people going, make them stop me. Wait, you understand why we have the rules is because we want to protect you, we want to protect your tenant, and we want to protect the neighbors in the community. And so if you don't pull permits, then we can't see what's going on. And then when fires happen and it's not properly protected, you lose everything. When somebody breaks in, you lose everything. When damage has happened because we put too much weight per square foot on the floor, you lose everything. When you open a restaurant or a food service business and you didn't contact the health department and you have no health department, you lose everything for a while. And so we'd rather you follow the protocol and take a little bit of time and let us get it done. And then the other part is when we get you to a certificate of occupancy inspection, a lot of people forget that we're just giving you the violations. However long it takes you to get those violations corrected and bring us back out to approve them is on the tenant. How long does it take to get that done? And so sometimes the extension of the work is because you weren't prepared for that kind of renovation or upkeep. So those are the four bigger issues when it comes to businesses that uh, we have to try to convince people that we're not trying to be bullies. We're trying to protect the commonwealth and the, the wellness of the entire city, one building, one business at a time. Any questions? Any arguments? Anything you want to throw at me? This would be the time. <laughs> And if it's too hard, I move fast, and we'll let him get it. <laughs> Any concerns? This is, we, we kind of skipped the planning session, which sometimes makes people nervous and takes a long time. But in this subject, these are crucial for people not to make mistakes. Yes, there's a lady in the back row. Yes, sir. This is very good information. Where, where would someone looking for the fees associated with the process, find those? Um, the easiest route, if you really can't find them and you're not computer savvy, is just to call the building department. The second is, um, they're online in, in the bottom section of the building department the category. So, for example, if you're looking for a, a, a zoning verification fee, to pay $25 for it to be written, put in, in motion, let our, our office take care of the clerical work, and then involve uh, Liz in her office and me in mine. It's worth everything of getting it done before you spend $4,000 on a lease that you don't ever get to use. So it would be that much of a valuable. All the permits are in our society, in our city. Our trades are designed on whatever you have to do. There's, they're an itemized list. They're already on the line. On the line. If you're doing any other construction, it's based on the price of the of the renovation. So if your project is going to cost you five thousand dollars, it's going to be billed based on five thousand dollars, and no bill will be any smaller than one hundred and fifteen. So it, that's where it will always start as a base price, and you'll work at it from every thousand beyond that. And I believe it's something like for every the first thousand, it's 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 at eighty-five dollars. After that, for every thousand, it's ten dollars for every thousand going forward. So there's a price tag set in motion in in how you you feed them. But they're online. Uh, they're on in the city webpage. Great question. Thank you for not throwing anything. Anything else? Yes, sir. Could you uh, speak a little bit about the difference between a uh, physical building business and an at-home business? Some of the uh, safety. Yeah, there's two different distinctions. Uh, a residential a home occupation occupation is designed um, first to go um, more than likely it'll go to the city clerk and she'll dismiss it until it comes to us. She'll give us the application and then we'll do a site review on the property because there's limitations for it. Number one, you can't have any uh, business vehicles and trucks and, and equipment on the outside of your business 
in your neighborhood. Uh, in other words, if you're a, a siding company from home business, you can have all your tractors and trailers and all your siding equipment sitting in your in front of your house in a, in, in, a, in a toolbox in your neighborhood where everybody knows. You can't have your crew come to your house and, and pick up the equipment because you have a crew of three and they just use your house as the, the loading storage and, and supply facility. But if you have a cleaning supply com a house, a company, and you're working out of your office and you go to businesses all over the, the Wayne County, then there's a possibility that would work adequately. Uh, we're also then going to make sure that you sign an affidavit of what you're not permitted to do by putting public signs of your business in your, in your single family neighborhood district. And then we just want to make sure that there are um, no violations on your house. In other words, sometimes people want to have a home occupation that are in a residential rental property and we want to make sure that the owner knows you're going to start a business out of their property and they give you approval so once we clear all the 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 issues then we'll approve it i'll sign off on it uh we'll look at the property make sure it's safe and it's healthy on the outside not looking at the inside of the building and then we'll give it back to the clerk to register that that registration um I think, uh, in, in principle, we've only closed in my five years here two. One was um, somebody who wanted to rebuild firearms and had a large collection of people walking in and out of his house with weapons and uh, with the support of the police department. We thought that may not be a really good idea for a neighborhood. And so we denied that one. But other than that, I don't think there's too many that we, we haven't. Yes, ma'am, in the second row. A business ready to come to Lane they, they go to the building department first, would you say? Yes, that would be the very first place because our planning division is third party and they come through our office for applications. So example, if you thought they wanted to start a business and they want to find out if it's zonable in that building, they're going to come to us, we're going to give them an application, they're going to fill it out, we're going to look at that and we will probably invite them if they would choose to do so, is to have what they call a pre-application meeting. That will include at least myself and Liz and we will sit on a Zoom meeting with them and let them ask any more questions they have, so they'll get to talk to us from the, the planning side, the, the drawing sides, the timeline sides, and then they'll ask about questions on the inside of the building. They get to talk with me. If I see some concerns, I'll throw a red flag up for them to prepare for it. And then from there, they will go on to, if they need to go to planning, they'll go there. If not, they'll be given a letter officially from our planner to tell them everything comes back to the building department and you can start your C of C, your C of O. And then once the C of O application is filled out, we're off and running. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, sorry. Could uh, someone from the assessment office uh, walk us through the personal property exemption uh, forms and concept? Um, right now, the first thing we need is a baseline. We need to know what you have. The limitations for next year, as Kate referenced, $180,000. The baseline paperwork. Generally, an accountant fills this out. It's relatively complicated, um, especially if you have a very specialized business. We just had a, a number of laws change in the last two weeks that we haven't had a chance to reference. But if they come into our office, we can help them with it, but we can't fill it out for them. Generally, what you're going to want to be able to do is to reference your inventory list that you give to the IRS. Um, the rule is cost new, not, oh, I bought it from Fred for 10 bucks. What is the item cost new? Then we apply the state's depreciation schedule and we come up with a baseline. If you're under this year $180,000, then you fill out this once. Then you fill out this form once. And that's all you have to do unless you change your business. If you add a whole lot of equipment, then you have to 
inform us so that we know that, okay, there's been a major change. Um, as many business owners know, personal property is slowly but surely going away. Um, for industrial facilities exemptions, for big projects, you can't even get one for personal property anymore because eligible manufacturing personal property is a whole separate issue and it's much, much different. Um, for commercial, things like vehicles, we see that all the time. People bring in, oh, well, you know, these are my cars. And no, you pay taxes to the state for that. You don't pay them here. Um, we're more than willing to go through the specifics, but the best person for you as a business owner is your accountant because that's what they do. That's what you pay them for. Um, and it comes up every year. Don't skip a year, because if you skip a year, especially that first year, like Katie said, I have to guess. I have to do an estimate. And what I do is I look around and I find other businesses that are, as far as I can tell, similar to yours. Um, dentist office. You know, you may not have a ton of equipment, but we have a lot of dentists that report, and some of those are fairly substantial money. Um, things like leasehold improvements, and I can go on like this for like the next six hours. Um, nobody really wants to hear it, but it's a relatively complex situation, so if they come in, talk to us. We're more than happy to help with personal property. Yes. So the twenty one twenty two is already completed. Correct. Okay. Now prior to that when if you had the eighty thousand, if you had personal property worth a hundred thousand, would it be assessed at the hundred minus the eighty, so twenty thousand? Or is it the other thousand? Twenty thousand. <laughs> and even then you may be under that limit. Depends on the depreciation. It's a whole, like I said, it's a whole lot more complicated and, and nobody really wants to hear me pontificate about this for hours. Um, but come in and talk to us because it's really important that you do because that's a lot of money. Okay. <laughs> we'll be here. You'd probably understand if you saw the form. <laughs> well, I've seen the form. Yeah, yeah, I've seen the form. <laughs> All right, so are there any other questions for anybody up on the on the panel here? Uh, if, um, if you don't file this by February 20th, you automatically are going to be assessed at 108000 now? No, no, no. It, 180000 is what the cutoff line is. Um, Unless you have a substantial business, and generally those would be manufacturing, um, we will do our best estimate as to what you have. Um, and you still have the opportunity to go to the Board of Review. That's your cutoff time. Once the Board of Review closes in March, then the estimate stands, and you really don't even have a choice as to how to appeal it because you didn't file. And the rule is, if you don't file, you don't get it. All right, so I know um, our EDC DDA director has a few questions for some on the panel, but I wanted to give another opportunity for those in the audience before we go to him. How do you, probably for Bob and, and, and uh, the building inspector, uh, oh. <laughs> how, do you, how do you handle are uh, what are the rules for somebody who repairs cars out of their garage or repairs motorcycles out of their garage or repairs small appliance and the cars are in residential neighborhoods and they don't have a sign they don't put any kind of thing up i mean they drive the car in at night working on it put it out in the street in the morning 
person comes later on after work, gets the car, drives it off, somebody else drops another one off. Small engine equipment the same way, brings a stove blower over, drops it off in the garage, and the guy says, come back, opens up the garage, you go back and get it, somebody else drops a lawnmower off. Same thing with motorcycles. You bring one in there, the guy's an ex-mechanic for Harley Davidson, for example, changes the oil, does a tune-up and all that stuff, pay cash or whatever, and you're gone, then somebody else says, hey, uh, are you open to start working, and the next person comes in. How do you handle that? I mean. It's a business, but it's not really a, you know what I'm saying? My, mine is going to be. You turn it off. <laughs> it's on the bottom. Mine's going to be shorter. Um, personal property works the same way as always. Um, the one thing we don't want to see somebody do, and I used to turn around for a living years ago, tools are expensive. Don't tell me you've got $400 worth of tools please. Because if you've got a snap-on box, well, you're already over that. Um, but with a $180,000 limit, you're, unless you've got a heck of a garage, you're probably going to be under that. So, and you get $1,000 off the top anyway if you're a resident. So, from my standpoint, get the paperwork. Fill it out, because I don't want to drive around in neighborhoods going, huh, he's fixing cars. <laughs> Uh, mine's easier than his. Um, it'll be simple. Once we have an indication that somebody is doing it, we'll borrow uh, LP Pride, we'll borrow the police department, and we'll borrow our inspectors to confirm that they can unequivocally guarantee that they are working mechanical businesses in their garage for other than their relatives. Once that happens, then we have all legal rights to prosecute, and we will. See, for once, I'm not the worst guy. <laughs> I just loved you better. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so Carl, go ahead with your... Yeah, uh, okay, I, this is uh, meant to provide a point of clarification. Uh, and it, I, the question is directed to both Bob and John. Um, Why don't you get some questions? Yeah, who's, who's going to go <laughs> first? Okay, so you talked about the responsibility of an owner. If they're going to uh, make investments in property, they have to come see the, the tax assessor. Uh, they have to get a bill for permit. Okay, the question is, what about the tenant that is doing leasehold improvements? Who's responsible for the building permit? Who's responsible to come into the assessor's office? And first, you have to have the proper definition of leasehold improvement. Um, they've changed the rules dramatically. So if you're going to go in and you're going to build an office in the back, mm, that's real property. It's not a leasehold improvement anymore. Leasehold improvements are generally, and not always, but generally something that you're going to pick up and walk out the door with when you close. That doesn't mean you're taking the entire kitchen with you. We are working really hard at taking leasehold improvements off personal property statements because some of them are three, four, five hundred thousand dollars and they shouldn't be there. It's real property. So we don't want to double dip them. But for very specific things, we do want them to report it. But again, that's why you have accountants to catch it on the front end. And if we see it on our end, and we do all the time, and we see a list, we go, no, no, yep, no, no. And we adjust or modify the personal property statement. OK, so the tenant then would come in to make that declaration? Well, the lawyer fills out the personal property statement. Okay. Okay. But if somebody doesn't, then the law says CITUS. So that means that the property owner may be going, and we just had one, going, but what, what's, what's this bill? And yeah. we had to estimate the business because nobody bothered to fill out the personal property. Yeah. I, you know, I'm asking this because um, we have a lot of businesses that wind up leasing and operating, and uh, so there's a little murkiness there. You talk very specifically about the property owner and so on. What about the building permit? 
learning process is similar in, in regards to the paperwork. Um, legally, everything comes down to the owner. They have the responsibility, unless they have written a lease that says you're responsible for putting the uh, 10,000 pound uh, heating system on the roof, it'll be your responsibility if it goes bad or if it needs to be replaced. When the, the tenant doesn't pay attention to their lease, then they become liable for all the repairs that they do in the building because they are the one filling the application uh, for renovation. And then based on the level of the renovation, if they're putting offices, bathrooms, and a kitchen in, then the reality is they're going to have to have article, uh, they're going to have to have an architectural drawing that's going to be sealed for that kind of structural design. People say, well, why? Well, it's because we're taking an open room like this and we're changing the uh, egress structure of how to get out on an emergency and we may be closing off ventilation systems and heating systems. So what would have filled this whole room for, ro for temperature and I close the room off the back and there's no system, then it doesn't stay warm or get the proper return air. So we need to see that. That's done on, on a commercial building by architects. So so it'll be the responsibility of either co owner or tenant based on how the lease agreement is written. Okay, but that is something that a tenant and landlord have to work out. Yep, and if if it does, if they don't work it out, it goes, it falls back to the owner. Right, or there's no permit, and it falls back, back to the owner. Problems. It will go back to the owner. Okay, thank you. I, I appreciate you clarifying that. Uh, also, this question is for Elizabeth. Um, so when you went through the zoning process, mm -hmm. you were primarily uh, talking about either a use that was uh, not a change of use, it was the same use, or it was a change of use, but it was permitted in that zoning district. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when is a zone change required? When do you get into variances? Please speak a little bit about that. Sure. So if we're at the zoning verification step, and you say you want to have whatever business, but it's not permitted in the zone that the property is currently zoned, um, you do have an option to request a rezoning or a zoning map amendment. So that would change the underlying zoning district of the property so that whatever use you want could be permitted. Um, John mentioned a little earlier that we often do a pre-application meeting with someone and so it, it would likely be in that venue that we sort of talk about this is what your option is um, these are the steps to do it um, it's a little it takes a little longer um, but it's it's certainly certainly possible so if your your use isn't permitted currently a property can be rezoned Another option is to go to the Zoning Board of Appeals for a variance. Um, you could either do, there's a use variance, which is, um, like it says, talking about the use, or um, the, the ZBA also evaluates um, dimensional variances, which is about um, concerning something that has to do with the dimension. So if you're, you know, the setback is 50 feet, it, but your building is, you want to put your building 40 feet to the property line, the ZBA could give you a variance from that dimensional requirement. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank okay. you. All right, so we'll give everybody one last chance here before we wrap up, if anybody has any questions for anybody on the panel. And I know this has come up, and it'll probably come up again. Mentioned John that a building occupied is better than a vacant building. I I get the idea that the city wants to promote different businesses and <coughs> encourage more restaurants and things like that in the city. And I'm all for that. I think some of the ordinances, and I bring this up only because I know they're looking at rewriting some of the ordinances regarding zoning. That I think the idea to say that an auto repair shop, for instance, is not permitted within 5,000 feet of another auto-related. So auto-related could be many things. A oil chain place, you couldn't have a used car lot within theoretically a mile. So if this was a brand new city and they put one on the corner of Southfield and Ford, Theoretically, you could only have one other 
auto related. We only have a gas station at Fort Dixon Outer Drive. I mean, those things like that, I think, is something that should be looked into. But I, but I do agree with the idea that we should got to encourage other businesses. So I bring this up just for future thoughts on it because I think that when you say that, and then we see, I see that businesses come in and they have they get turned down by the building department because it's within 5,000, 20 feet or whatever the number is of another place. And then somebody else down the street puts in a auto repair shop and they go to, they come in and I'm assuming that the building department said no, they went to the ZBA and they got approved. I just think that when you tell somebody hard, fast, no, and not say, you, there are other options you can apply, or you can uh, look into different avenues to accomplish this. I think that's, I think that's the part where I think some things, get, when people say the building department won't work with us, because they tell them no, and they say, okay, that's gospel. They, they don't say there are alternatives. You can appeal this. You can. I appreciate, and I think oftentimes, and I don't, by any way, want to just uh, dismantle the ladies that work in the office, but they're going to give oftentimes the, the first answer that is clear to, to them. And that's why we highly recommend that there's a, a register. They should be saying what you need to do is just give us a vote zoning verification so you know what you're doing. They'd rather ask it on the phone if they don't know the details. You are correct. They should be able to be told everything. If they get to a zoning um, pre-application meeting, we're going to give all the details. We're going to explain the inside of the building as well as the outside. The other big issue that we get on, on zoning pre-application meetings is they don't like the idea that she has the troubled spot of making sure the outside of the building is up to modernization. In other words, if you your parking lot is now turned into alligator and it's gravel and it's not blacktop, we're going to ask that to be changed to meet the code of the current because it's been worn out. And, and then we're going to go to the engineer to get their confirmation that this can't be just skim coated and called it a day. We're going to have to do something else. That bothers people because they're not prepared to, to take that kind of expense into a project. Speaking, if I can, um, into the future and, and, and give insight to your, your response. When we look into this next rewriting of the zoning, I think it's not a, even about just writing all the zoning districts, but it'll be more adequately taking not a new city, but a built out city and accepting the um, evolution of where it has been. And example, our city does have a 5,000 foot setback on a definition that's been there since the 1990, late 1990s. What makes it difficult to make people think about it correctly is over the years, a building department may have said no. They've gone to the ZBA and without all the reasons they said yes. And, and the really, we should be writing our current ZBA notices and our ordinances to meet the today and the future with definitions and definitives of where the city is and where it needs to go. Uh, so that when the ZBA does get it, it's not the job of the ZBA to be quick about changing the zoning, but accept it and support that zoning and really have viable reasons. So when we think of this issue of 5,000 foot setback, it probably theoretically has been um, overridden by ZBA or someone else many times over the last 25 years why it's been in place when when in rule it might have been better 20 years ago to take it out of the books or redefine the definition of all the different distinctions and so what we did in 2019 to offset that to give it a little bit of balance is we added in the master plan uh, auto zone overlays so there's places in the city that are already overloaded with different types of auto issues and we should direct more auto issues into that area instead of just anywhere where there's an open building. So I think you're right, it needs to be addressed and I think there's multiple ways to address it. But I think it starts with removing 
language in our zoning code, uh, in our zoning ordinances um, that no longer fit the dynamics of a built out city where it won't fit anymore. But we should be cautious not to over underwrite that so anything can come in and we become, um, what would be the word, um, saturated with certain kinds of businesses where everybody eventually cho chokes out themselves. So I think you're right, and I think the zoning is way overdue in that subject to be corrected. And, and I think as the city makes plans right now to rewrite their or the zoning, it'll give us a chance for us to bring many other topics that are vaguely written in definitions to the, the Planning Commission and then to the Council for a fresh look going into the next 10 years. Does that help? Well, I, I, that's what I expected you to say. You should. I just think that there's, I mean, for example, the Sears flat. If Flannery Ford, who used to be on course here, decided to put up a, a car dealership at Dixon Southfield in the Sears lot, Huge tax base, tax base. Theoretically, they could correct. And I think that when you say auto repair, or, I mean, originally that came into effect when there started to be a bunch of gas stations in the city, and the council decided at that time we have enough gas stations. Right. So when they owned it, over overloaded it to. They wrote it vaguely, and in writing that vaguely, they, they lost sight of why they wrote it in the first place, and they never modified it. But I think the system, even as poorly as I might think the particular zoning is written in that topic, it still has the right to do what you've asked. And if I'm going to say no because I'm the staff that has to hold the, the rule of the, of the zoning ordinance, it has another place to go. And if it goes to ZBA and, and it gets there, it does have the right to get to council and they get to even override that. So there's two more stages. If there's a, a real desperate need that we believe one particular business needs to go in a particular place and the building official is following the ordinance as they are written, the planning is right following the ordinances as they are written, there are several other steps to continue to hear the argument. And that has obviously happened in this city many, many times over the lifetime, way before I arrived. There's hands over there. Yeah, I, I just want to add um, another perspective on this zone, uh, zoning code update that we're talking about. Uh, real simple. Um, the ordinance that we have right now is about 19, mid 1990s vintage, okay? Things have changed. We don't, there are uses missing in that ordinance. We struggle every day when somebody has a new idea and they come in and we got to say, you know, we don't even have that use in the ordinance. So we've got to modernize the ordinance for today. Um, that's one. Number two, we want to make it practical for our built environment to put a label on what John's talking about. And number three, and this might even be more important than those two things, we really want to take a look at the process and ask the question, are there some items that are now going through uh, site plan review or some other elongated um, public hearing thing? Can they be handled administratively? That will help expedite land use decisions and will help expedite business placement. Do you have anything to say? I was just going to offer clarification about the 5,000 foot setback, just because I look at this every day. Um, f just for your knowledge, um, the 5,000 foot setback only applies to um, repair centers, service stations, and fuel stations. It does not apply to auto sales. All right, we've got another question in the audience here. Uh, is the architecture going to be required on all of the new permits? No, only on a constructional repair project on a commercial building. 
And if they're going to be on a house renovation, they don't have to no. be that until I mean, the house is over 3,500 square feet. I mean, square. something like a sign or something, you need an architectural drawing for that? Or? It's, it's recommended that you have a sign company give us a sketch of what they want. Because it's our ordinance and sign for commercial businesses are, again, designed specifically for the shape, size, and dimension of the building and not just a, a canopy. I got that. Yeah, so I, I, here, I, I know. Is it happy done by an architect or a company or can or a licensed engineer? Oh, licensed, okay. But they have to be able to seal it as if they're the ones because on a commercial building, those sign, those signatures are what will fulfill the law. Okay. It won't be the contract, it won't be yeah. the law. I kept hearing that. I know they had a real problem. Mm -hmm. I don't blog to them, but I know of it. So. Okay. All right. Oh, we have another one. Um, do we have any guidelines? documentation spacing. Well, this is kind of what needs to happen. This is, um, it's really a, a wild range, but the truth would be we have some timelines that are beyond our control. Example, if it has to go to planning with a public hearing, then we're regulated by this city by the charter to put every one of our public hearings in the newspaper. And that pushes a timeline that we need 15 days by law to get it in their newspaper. So we have to make sure it gets that further out in front and get it published before it even gets in. So there's that timeline that looks like forever, but it's set based on the city's charter of where we have to put our publications in and then how long it takes to get them because our publication doesn't process uh, five days a week or seven days a week. So we have to find a way to get it in a Monday or a, or a Sunday or a, a month or Wednesday. And so that is a, is a timeline that's always going to be there and going to change that piece of the charter. So there's a slow piece. The other parts of the timeline are really going to be in uh, Liz's office in performance standards and my office for levels of performance standards. So example, when we do a plan review for a building that is, that is renovating, uh, and not a complete, just a renovation, it shouldn't be longer in, in plan review. It shouldn't be longer than five business days. That's the goal of, of our standard of performance. Liz has her own set of how long it really takes it. And, and if I'm not mistaken, a full set of site plan reviews takes about an eight hour window of time if you're not disrupted. So it might take one of them, plus all the other pieces that have to go in. So there's some timelines in it that are, are pretty well set in place and then we do not try to change our planning commission, ZBA, and our dangerous building boards to other than the exact location that they are presently. Planning commission is the first, is the second Wednesday, the ZBA is the third Thursday, and the dangerous building is the fourth Thursday. So depends on if you have to get your 15 days in and you miss that window, you're going to get back out for the next month. And you go, wow, that seems like forever. So what he's talking about, and Carl speaking about, how can some of these pre-existing buildings with some new levels of limitations be permitted to have administrative decisions? Right now, that's not written in our ordinance for us to make. But if we do, then we can make some practical movements inside a building, inside a street of buildings that have two buildings in it, and one, two other empty, and then just go to occupy one. We can eliminate them, but right now those aren't in the writings, and so we have to proceed the way we have been. So there's a longer span because of public hearing notices, and then when is that public hearing notice when you come to us? Say when your when your planning meeting is. So if we if it comes if you're coming in the third what the third what Monday morning of of the month, you're not going to hit a public hearing meeting in time to get it in February's next. I mean, in the next month's planning meeting, it's just going to be way too late. So then you go, well, I have to wait a whole month and a half? Yeah, because there's the timeline windows. 
charter says we have to put it in the newspaper, we have to get a 15 day public notice, that means we have to get in front of them before 12, those many days. Also, she will have to have the plan review done before we can put the public notice in, because that's what we're going to have to be evaluating. So we're trusting it all gets juggled. If, if not, that's where the timeline is. I'll also add that it's not just charter, but it's state law to have it published in a newspaper. It's been state law forever, and there's been talks to change it and allow for online publication, but the legislature just every session drops it. So, um, are there any more questions from the audience? I see one more. Yeah. Uh, we've talked about it several times. We keep hearing about there's going to be a book that go to City Hall, <coughs> and for a new business owner can go, go break down the list of stuff that says what order they have to go in, and when when they can get this, when will the, when will this book be ready? There's a preliminary of that application already online. There is a a green and weird colored seven steps to opening the business, and behind it there is an application that is processed and produced from the clerk's office for a long period of time, and it will be the same. What we can do, and what we can do to modify it, is bring up some of the other timelines that you could be prepared for, such as a public hearing if needs be, where it's going to come in, when does your public uh, planning meetings have to be. It, many of those calendar dates aren't in it, but it's already pretty much about, I would suggest, 75% written without some of the supporting subjects that you guys have asked tonight. How long does it take to get a public newspaper uh, registered? When should I plan on that? How long will it take for her to write that? So when you give it to me, to uh, the application, and you're filling it out today, but you don't have your drawings yet for planning review, then I, she can't review until she has a copy of the planning review. So from that date when she gets it, we can start talking about advertising in the newspaper, putting it in, in, the, in, a, in a date, and which second Wednesday of the month is it going to be in public meeting? That could probably be added to the list that isn't in that chart. That could be added to that book line so that people might have that opportunity. But everything else is already published in the city web page. Oh, oh, yes. Got one in the back here. For the, the EDC into planning, um, all of the discussion tonight has all been entrepreneurial driven from the outside coming in. I have a goal, I have a dream, I have an idea. Is there is there any effort by EDC or council or any or to actually go out and seek businesses and bring them in as opposed to waiting for somebody to have an idea? That was the one question. The other question, most of the lots, the pretty in the downtown district are small and tight. Is there ever a discussion about a wholesale buyout and creating uh, a large buildable place, bigger footprints, for bigger corporations to come in and set landmark, landmark type businesses? Okay, those are two very good questions. I'm glad you asked them. Um, okay, here's the reality on uh, business search, okay? We have a, a difficult time in the city of Lincoln Park because in the in the trade we're a, a, we have a weak local economy. Okay, you know, unfortunately, our once upon a time in the mid '70s when we were at the pinnacle of success, we had a very vibrant community. We had 50,000 people living here. Uh, we had a very middle-income community. Uh, there were businesses all over the place, okay? There's a bunch of reasons why, you know, the businesses shuttered and we got vacancies. There's a good reason why Sears closed, you know? Okay, you know, we've been, we've been um, working with those property owners and we've been advocating, uh, in particular, mixed-use development. But what, what the property owners are telling us is that uh, the best we can hope for are some warehouse developments, which is not really exciting. Uh, that's not going to generate any new population, and it's just kind of waving a white flag. So, 
so we really are, we, we got to go back to fundamentals and uh, quite frankly uh, we have to do something with these major properties that are becoming available to get mixed-use development in there with some housing element so that we can have some population growth now we did have some population growth between 2010 and 2020 first time in 50 years in the mid 50s excuse me in the mid 70s around our 50th anniversary we had over 50,000 people in the community in 2010 we had about 36,000 so it took a nosedive nosedive in addition to that our population became very economically needy we are a majority low moderate income community those factors are impediments to attracting uh, businesses here okay so so you know we're we're sitting there um, you know trying to advocate to get some uh, housing development at these sites which we think in the, in the long term will help in the short term you know we'll get some new population in construction things of that nature it'll help the assess value uh, so that's all positive um, so you know if we just run out you know I've, I've made some contacts to some restaurants and a little bit of this and a little bit of that and they're very polite and you know they say they'll get back with us and it doesn't happen um, but you know we, we still keep trying now your second question was um, yeah okay here's the here's the real easy answer for that we don't have the money to buy all that and clear things out wholesale what we are doing though and this is a joint project between the DDA and the EDC we have targeted a specific block on Fort Street the 2200 block uh, on the east side there there's essentially five vacant buildings there we have uh, we made some modifications to our downtown development plan just recently thank you City Council they had to give us the go-ahead and our plan is to buy all of those properties or get working relationships with the property owners and then en masse get those buildings renovated and create a business incubator opportunity for uh, entrepreneurs that exist in this community you heard we have a list of home occupations home occupations sometimes grow out of the home and those could be likely candidates to go into incubator space we have this fledgling and very significantly growing entrepreneurial class the Hispanic population we we are working you know we're trying to develop a strategy and retool what we're doing so that we're multicultural bilingual uh, so that we can create relationships you know we're, we're, we're talking to the businesses that have organically popped up on 4th Street um, you know that's all in the right count but this is going to take some time it's not going to have an overnight you know we, we were at a pinnacle 50 years ago and you know I'm not casting stones but it went downhill from there uh, please don't take any offense uh, but the numbers you know make the point and it's going to take effort and some of these things that we talked about this evening to kind of turn it around and ignite, ignite some excitement particularly in the downtown but along that line the one, one department that's not here today is the police department so as a business owner the things i know i can count on is homeless guy sleeping behind my building graffiti painted on it mm -hmm. my car broken into for small change so we don't have so that those are the things that add to stigma yeah. the very same thing that you're talking about when we go to talk to business owners in other communities we have stigma others have a vibe yeah. somewhere that needs to change in a cultural effort. i don't know enough about that but that would be an observation that i would make yeah and i appreciate that and um that's a very valid point and uh you know we you know our, our police department our public safety people they're cognizant of the problem but you know there's a disconnect the stuff is happening what do we have to do to improve so that we can eradicate 
those issues. Thank you. Yeah. All right. I'll give one last chance here to close out on a final question. Um, all right. Not seeing any. Um, and on behalf of the, the panel up here, thank you everybody for coming out tonight. Um, hopefully, you get some good information um, that you can take back to to the ideas and, and anybody you know that is looking to, to open some businesses here in the city. So thank you guys for coming.